Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Wear Tech Center and the Phoenix Wearable Ecosystem Open House and Innovator Conversation. I see we have a very diverse group joining us today. Um, according to this poll, the majority of us are industry professionals. I am Vicki Mayo, and I am so excited about moderating this event for all of you. I'm the CEO and founder of the Touchpoint Solution, inventors of a wearable technology that alleviates stress at the press of a button in just 30 seconds. As an innovator myself in the wearable tech space, I know the value of a supportive ecosystem. Access to support systems is key for innovation success. Today, we have an amazing lineup for you, broken down into three separate acts. First, we're gonna hear about some amazing projects that are underway at the Wear Tech Center. In act two, we're going to discuss how to find the financial resources that will transform your ideas into commercial products. And in act three, we will cover the incredible resources that we have right here in Greater Phoenix to bring projects to life as successful businesses and products. And I know that you're not gonna to wanna to miss our curtain call as we're giving you the chance to meet the speakers that you'll see here today in a choose your own adventure happy hour. So be sure to get that cocktail ready to go at 4 p.m. So let's jump right in and let's hear about the three great projects being developed here at the WearTech Center. The WearTech Center is located in the heart of Phoenix at Park Central Business Park on Central Avenue. The WearTech Center takes innovative ideas that have been developed through fundamental research at the university, combines those ideas with businesses that want to commercialize those ideas adds in public financial resources to accelerate the process and ends up with products that are ready to go to market. Today, we're gonna to see videos about three Wear Tech Center projects, and then we'll spend a few minutes talking to the innovators that are developing, developing these projects. The first project is one that I'm very excited about. It's an anti-anxiety device being developed by Nick Hool. That demo will be followed by fascinating fall prediction advice that's being developed by third technology capital investors, Dr. Thurman Lockhart for ASU and the Moore Foundation. And third, we're gonna to get to see a project focused on developing standards and testing protocols for exoskeletons. Who knew that Greater Phoenix is a hotbed for exoskeleton development? Are you ready to go? Let's check them out. Ever since I could walk, I was hitting golf balls in the backyard with my dad. My dad would take me to the local driving range. I just had this obsession with uh, playing golf. And when I was about 14 years old, um, I played in a local tournament and I actually won the tournament. And that's when I realized, wow, I'm pretty good at this game. I, let's see what I can do. But then when I was about 17 or 18 years old, for whatever reason, I just started um, dealing with anxiety. I couldn't really get a handle on it. You know, my game suffered because of it and ultimately lost out on being able to play uh, competitive golf in college. I knew that there had to be some type of a solution that wasn't a drug that could help people just like me reduce their anxiety right when they need relief. And when I went to school at ASU, we developed what's called a, a vagal nerve stimulation device. It is a electrical nerve stimulation device that non-invasively applies a mild amount of electricity over a nerve called the vagus nerve, which controls your body's natural relaxation response. In order for us to you know, successfully develop this product and get it through FDA clearance and bring it to market, we connected with the WearTech Applied Research Center and they, in the very beginning, allowed us to come into their space and set up shop there. It's made all the difference in our ability to rapidly prototype devices, get people in to get feedback on what we're doing. I think our biggest success to date has been the results that came out of our first pilot study that demonstrated our product was safe, but also effective. Everyone that received the treatment, 100% of them said they found the treatment to be relaxing and effective. For decades, medication has been the first line of treatment. 
but there isn't one drug on the market that doesn't have any side effects. There's no doubt that people are desperate for some type of effective drug-free solution. Um, and I think we are in, a, in an awesome position to provide the first FDA cleared device to provide acute relief for these people. My name is Lockhart, but my dad's my name is Lockhart as well. My dad was a very interesting guy. He was a World War II veteran uh, and a fought in Korea, as well as Vietnam. And he was uh, what we call frequent faller. Uh, he was very frail. So the design of this system is called the Lockhart Monitor. That's for him, actually. So historically, in order to assess the balance and stability of uh, patients and subjects, we have to bring them into a laboratory that has a tremendous amount of equipment that's quite expensive and time consuming to run those studies. But there are accelerometers and gyroscopes within every smartphone. We believe that by clipping a cell phone with some of those same types of sensors built in, we can get a lot of the same data with very high fidelity and really eliminate the need for the lab in certain cases. So fall detection monitor, we worked on it 20 years ago. What we are trying to do is fall prediction. Predict fallers before they fall. Because remember that for the older adults, if you fall just that one time, your, your chances of falling increases. But not only that, you're, you, know, you have a chances of death uh, significantly. So what, do you, what you want to do is you want to avoid that first fall, whatever you do. So this, this system will actually predict an individual before they fall, of their instability in terms of their walking style, walking, uh, as well as how they stabilize themselves. So step one is validating the sensors that are within the phone. Step two is developing our own sensor that communicates with the phone and becomes basically a range extender of those uh, sensors that are in the phone. WearTech has really allowed this program to develop and be successful. Uh, without the wear tech support, we would have uh, technology developed at the university, we would have a company trying to commercialize that, but we wouldn't be able to do the clinical validation that we're doing here today. When we move this technology actually into the patient population and start to prevent falls from occurring, we are preventing pain and suffering, we are decreasing the cost of care in the country, and we are saving lives at the end of the day. I was a company commander in a uh, parachute unit. We typically jump in pitch darkness, so you can't see the ground. And uh, I landed on an object and my, I broke my leg, dislocated my shoulder. In the military, uh, musculoskeletal injury is the number one reason for evacuation from a theater. And so I was personally motivated back then to develop augmentation like exoskeletons to help us protect, you know, our backs and our shoulders and our necks. Uh, I got out and started GoX Labs. Uh, and with Tom and I started the Wearable Robotics Trade Association. The ultimate goal is to uh, improve worker wellness. So we do know that many workers over time can have back pain. And so these types of exoskeletons will assist you while lifting or pushing objects and make it easier to do the task. We want to develop this wear tech facility where Arizona can be a leader in testing and understanding uh, how exoskeletons can be used and to develop standards that can be propagated across uh, uh, the workforce. At GoX Labs, we are working on multiple pro projects and products. So one project is exoskeleton technology to mitigate injury. And then our bread and butter is the development of wearable sensors and software that helps us to predict future injury and illness in the workforce. This smart watch right here is a Samsung Galaxy watch. And then it has on it our software. With it, we can measure things like uh, oxygen saturation, heart rate, resting heart rate, heart rate variability, cadence, steps. 
And all of those measurements helps us to predict things like falls and trips. Tied to this is another piece, another sensor. Via Bluetooth, it can, communicates with a watch and it allows us to understand movement and injury risk, back injury risk, shoulder injury risk, knee injury risk. Our vision at GoX Labs, at WearTech, and, and with Tom Sugar in Arizona State, it's to be able to predict diabetes before it happens. It's the ability to predict cardiovascular disease before it happens, the heart attack before it happens, and interdict. Those videos were incredible, and the projects are so fascinating. Let's get to talk to those innovators behind those products. We have Dr. Nick Hool, Dr. Joe Hitt, and Dr. Thurman Lockhart with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. First, Nick, anxiety relief in the time of COVID is a winner. Uh, I've personally seen that through our product, the touch points. How soon are we gonna be able to see this product on the market? Well, hey, Vicki, uh, it's good to be here. Um, you can hear me all right, right? Yeah, yes. Cool, yeah. Um, so we are, we're doing a lot of groundwork right now, working with the FDA, uh, launching a prospective national clinical trial. And uh, if all things go well, we should be looking at a late 2021 launch. So, um, you know, nine to 12 months, this will be available for anyone. You know, the FDA has been at the forefront of everyone's minds lately, as we've all been waiting with bated breath on an expedited vaccine approval. Will you be able to get an expedited review from the FDA? Uh, we looked into that actually, and there were a couple options we could have taken to get expedited review, but it would have resulted in a slight change in our indication of use that we are seeking. And so we felt it best we didn't want to really venture into other indications. We, we are comfortable with what we're currently pursuing. Um, and as well, since our product is brand new and it's never been on the market, we haven't yet established um, you know, a, a large enough safety profile that the FDA would uh, be comfortable with giving you know, an emergency use authorization. And so um, unfortunately we are in it for the long path. Do you think the Wear Tech Center can help? Yeah, the, the Wire Attack Center has been huge so far, uh, especially in, first of all, just providing us with the space uh, to operate out of it and providing us with some funds to uh, develop some manufacturing techniques and, and prototyping and product development. But uh, with the first product that we built, we ran our first pilot and feasibility study out of the Wire Attack Center. And, and that was probably the most important thing we've done to date because it demonstrated our product was safe uh, well tolerated in our target population um, and it was shown to be effective as well and, and so in that sense I mean where tech has been um, extremely valuable for our company. I love it. One last question before I move over to Joe. I know you said it's going to be available late 2020. Um, I know the question everyone's wondering is it going to be available for everyone what that you'll be able to buy it directly or will you have to go to a doctor in order to get it? Yeah, um, so late 2021, um, it will be an over-the-counter device. Uh, it will not be an off-the-shelf device. So it, it will be available for anyone that stumbles upon our website and finds the device available. And if they are willing and able to purchase it, it, it will be available for anyone. So That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Nick. We will all be watching your journey and we can't wait to see the the product emerge on the market late 2021. Awesome, thank you. Joe, uh, moving on to you. Um, you know, loved hearing about the video and all the work that you're doing. Once you validated your testing and your protocols, what's next? Well, once we've tested it and it's validated, really the next step is uh, sales and marketing. What we're trying to do is develop a product and the product is test standards and um, guarantees a stamp of approval on the effectiveness and safety of an exoskeleton. Mm -hmm. And so we wanna make sure that we get the word out 
And once uh, we get through some sales and marketing, uh, we want to generate revenue, recurring revenue that allows us to expand this capability here in the Valley. Love it. Is your goal to attract more exoskeleton developers to Phoenix and to Arizona? Absolutely. One of the key goals for us uh, at WearTac, at the Wearable Robotics Trade Association, uh, or myself personally, is to um, get exoskeleton developers from around the world to meet us here in this truly beautiful place, you know, that we call home. Now, during your video, you mentioned that you're working on several different products. Um, you know, with all, that many going on, tell us, you know, personally, I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but which one of these, um, you know, inventions or products is your favorite? I think the, for me, the kind of the most important things um, and the thing that I'm the most excited about are uh, exoskeletons, you know, wearable robotics because we truly believe that it's going to transform us. Uh, it's, it, you know, it already is in the factory floor. It's mm -hmm. being tested by the military. Soon we're gonna see grandmas and grandpas wearing this. And many of you out in the audience are gonna be wearing these. And so uh, making Arizona a hub for this and WearTech a hub for testing and standardization is very exciting. I love the vision. Uh, it gets me excited as well. I do hope that we are able to, to transform um, Arizona to state that becomes known for all of its exoskeleton work because, you know, prior to maybe the last six or eight months, I didn't even know about it. So <laughs> I love that you're educating people and bringing this here. And thank you again so much for joining us this morning. Absolutely. It's a uh, pleasure. Great afternoon. <laughs> um, Thurman. You know, curious, how did the Wear Tech Center help you to bring your idea to life? Yes, uh, thanks for having us here. And uh, yeah, Wear Tech Center has uh, helped us to, you know, as talked about in the video, you know, bridging the gap between the, you know, fundamental knowledge and, uh, you know, actual product and use, use, you know, usable product, actually, mm -hmm. not just the product. So bridging that gap has been a uh, tremendous help uh, from World Tech, where we are actually able to collaborate with the clinicians uh, as well as uh, bu business leaders uh, you know, within, the, uh, within the sector. So this has helped us uh, tremendously and bring into a reality, the idea to a reality. That's so great. Now, you know, you, we saw in the video how people were wearing sensors and was measuring, you know, and predicting the ability for falling. Once that product is validated, you know, what's, what happens next? Yeah, so currently we are doing some validation, variety of validation. And uh, once that is done, then it's going to go directly into the clinic, clinical setting uh, within the core institute uh, uh, for the readmission type of uh, assessment. Uh, before they go home, they could check uh, using the system and then also telemetrically identify these individuals. Uh, we are also utilizing this system in concussion uh, assessment as well, sideline concussion assessment. Uh, we're collaborating with a company who is, uh, of course, you know, COVID is kind of a, uh, kind of a limited uh, currently, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, the seasons will go pretty soon and uh, we'll be able to help out with that. So there, there are uh, several different uh, outline of this product uh, that we are about to uh, uh, you know, go forward with after validation. Now, Thurman, just out of curiosity, you mentioned that um, it might be used maybe more in a rehabilitatory setting or make a physical therapy type setting after yes. someone has, let's say, a hip surgery, right? Maybe to check to ensure that they're safe and stable to go home without risk of fall. Um, right. So is the the goal of this to be a consumer product or is it going to be more used by medical professionals? Yeah, both, I think. Uh, so medical professional can also use that as well as individuals. It's going to be actually designed for, you know, uh, you know for example, older adults uh, to, to use it, mm -hmm. measure themselves, identify, you know, what is really wrong with them because, you know, the, the, the reason for falls are not that simple. And using this type of information that we could actually provide can, uh, can actually pinpoint, you know, how to actually uh, train and, and uh, you know, remedy this situation. So. I love it. 
Well, we're very excited to see all three of your products, um, you know, come onto the market. Thank you so much for all of your time. And audience, I'm sure you have many questions to ask these innovators. Remember, all of our panelists will be available in our networking happy hour at 4 p.m. to answer all of your questions. So keep a running list and stick around and join that discussion. Now, switching on to act two, raising capital. Today, we have a wonderful panel joining us. Um, please, first of all, meet Romy Dillon. Personally, Romy is one of my favorite people with an energy that's both infectious and calming all at once. Romy is the founder and managing director at the Arizona Founders Fund. The fund is Arizona's first ever seed and early stage investing in startups with checks between $50,000 and $400,000. Next is Mike Sember, board member and school chair at Desert Angels. Desert Angels is an Arizona state when talking about funding in Arizona, and for good reason. Desert Angels is a Tucson-based organization of over 100 accredited investors, making a real difference in our ecosystem. Desert Angels is ranked number one in the Southwest and number eight nationally based on deal activity. Something, something to definitely take note of. And finally, Arif Damji is an investor with Conductive Vet Ventures. They're based in the Bay Area, and Conductive Ventures is an expansion stage investor in enterprise hardware and software and actively looks at wear tech. They have over $250 million uh, under assets under management between two different funds. So let's get started. Romy, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> Raising capital can be so intimidating. Tell us, what are three things that are most important for innovators to do to prepare for raising capital from a fund such as yours? Thanks, Vicki. It's great to be on the panel today with everyone. I think, um, look, I mean, it's hard for all of us, even those on the investing side of the table. But for our startups, I think it's important just to think about, you know, three items, you know, is what I call the PHX framework. You know, you want to think about the problem, you want to think about the hardware that you're building, and you want to think about the X factor. So when it comes to the problem, I think it's important for an entrepreneur to be crystal clear about, you know, is the problem popular? Is it growing? Is it just urgent, mandatory? Um, how often is this problem occurring, you know, that, you know, they're trying to solve and that their product solves for? Then you have the hardware. The hardware is obviously with regard to wear tech, where you really kind of begin to separate and be able to say the uh, this product is more important than the distribution strategy early on. So I think that, you know, you want to be able to really detail the margins around developing your product. What does the roadmap look like? Uh, the development schedule, who are your key partners, and, you know, what sort of agreements do you have with your partners? Those two things then get you to probably an X factor. And entrepreneurs need to be crystal clear, too, about the X factor. That's the ultimate reason for winning, right? You know, um, what's your unfair advantage? Uh, have you made an insight on the market? Are you that leader that your consumers will look towards for answers? Um, is your market growing at 20% a year? Uh, is your product 10x better? Can you get your customers and your beta users to say that? Um, your acquisition model, ideally, you want it to be zero. Um, you know, not all... Uh, Paid acquisition isn't the only way to go uh, a lot of the time. And you then you want to see where can we create a network effect here? So I think all of those items, if you can have one or more of those X factors, I think you really be able to, you know, have productive conversations with investors who can really be able to support you and want to be able to move to the next step of the process with you. Thanks. Oh, that's great. That you packed a lot of information in there and so many good questions, but I love that PHX model. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have lots of other questions and people picking your brain during our, our happy hour with your group later. Um, Mike, curious to hear, uh, you know, what are your thoughts? Romy mentioned that model, but in your mind, what's the most important thing that an innovator can tell you, you know, quickly during that 30 second pitch that's going to capture your interest? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I agree with everything Romy said, of course. Um, but to me, the uh, the most important thing is to 
uh, perfect what we call the elevator pitch. So what we want in a relatively short period of time, meaning, you know, depending on the circumstances, you know, a minute or so, two minutes, I want to know what is truly unique about your technology. And most importantly, what unmet need in the marketplace is going to be met uh, with your product and, and, and why, how, how does that happen? What is your, what does your technology impart to solve that unmet need? Uh, we'll get into all the other things such as your background as an entrepreneur, um, you know, IP and all those sorts of things, but truly being able to capture quickly, you know, what the unmet need is and why your, your opportunity is so unique is the most important thing for me. No, that's great. Um, you know, Arif, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts on what Romy and Mike shared. Um, are there absolutes that you need to see to fund a company? And, and specifically because you're later stage, um, you know, and Mike and, and Romy are maybe a little earlier stage. How does that change that, that conversation? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for, for having me. And, and everything that's been said is exactly, you know, as it should be. So for us, even stage agnostic, we are investing into WearTech from more of an, an um, enterprise focus. So it's often the B2B2C component or the enablers, like one of our portfolio companies, uh, Ambic Micro. And so again, large enough market where you clearly can get your addressable segment and grow it. The technology mode, the product mode um, component is going to be key. And then obviously the team having the expertise and the drive. And then to your point, because we are going to be a little bit later stage, the traction component is key. And when you think about the traction component, it's absolutely being able to drive those revenues up and, and acquire the clients that you need um, to really showcase that this is, this is you know, getting product market fit, but doing so in a cost-effective way. Um, where tech is expensive, it does require a lot of capital. And so being cognizant of, of both the, the revenue and cost component is key and happy to Happy to expand. Yeah, please. I would love to actually hear more about that. Can you tell us a little bit more? Um, is there a secret formula that you feel that your, your COGS needs to be at in order to, um, you know, is there a magic ratio that we, we should all be aiming towards if we're looking for that funding? Yeah, I, I wish there was, a, there was just one number I could throw out. Obviously, it's, it's very dependent. But what I would tell you is, you know, for us, when we are thinking about investing in and we're thinking about where those costs go, trying to get to revenue as quickly as possible, I think is, is key, obviously with that differentiated product. And so having the right ecosystem around you, being in a lower cost area with the right talent, that's not going to require you to have a war chest and going to customers early so that you get the pilot period done, at least from the enterprise perspective, so that once you get the breadth, you're actually able to really bring those clients alongside you get the minimum orders, get the commits up. And so I certainly wouldn't want to say, you know, it's, it's you know, get to revenue within, um, within X dollars raised, but it, it's just as quickly as you can, being cognizant that it is going to require a good amount in many of these examples. Mm -hmm. well, you had mentioned, you know, we're talking about uh, similar acquisition costs. You said, you know, zero dollar acquisition is is uh, you know most preferred. What are your thoughts? You know, being uh, more of a seed and early stage, do you, are you looking for that traction? Is that a, a requisite in order to fund a company? You know, I mean, of course, more traction the better. The more we like to, you know, uh, more customers are using the product, the more word of mouth, which is the zero dollars of you know acquisition cost. But you know, just given that we are an early investor. Um, and at the earliest stage possible, we don't have that benefit. And it's a tall order to ask every entrepreneur to say, especially in where tech, you know, go on out there, build your first revenue, get your first enterprise client, uh, build your product, and then we'll take a look after that. In where tech, it does require you know, an investment upfront. Um, it's not like software. It's not like subscription opportunities that exist within, you know, uh, cybersecurity and consumer and enterprise B2B, you know, products within, you know, um, in SaaS. It's just, 
really, really hard to be able to do it in word tech. So hopefully the right investor is going to respond to an entrepreneur who can just be able to frame, you know, their entire uh, product thesis. And I think that the development pipeline, the, the uh, partners, all of those items are going to help local investors here statewide to be able to participate in what that entrepreneur is doing. Yeah. Mike, piggybacking off something that Arif said, he talked a lot about the team and especially raising up your company in a place where you have access to that, that high quality talent, you know, at, hopefully at a more affordable rate. You know, how, how important do you think it is, especially when you're looking more from, you know, the angel's perspective, um, is that team? Is the, the team more critical? Is the idea more critical? Well, the old adage uh, in investing is that we invest in people and not mm -hmm. companies and not technologies. And, you know, there's uh, other ways to spin that. You can, some people say, I'd rather invest in an A team with a B technology or a B idea. Um, so team is absolutely critical. Um, the trick here uh, in, as Rami said, in these early stage companies is um, they're often led by uh, entrepreneurs coming out of academia, uh, don't have a great deal of business experience. So what we look for is coachability. We look for whether or not those, uh, those uh, entrepreneurs will be uh, able to, to adjust and, and, and allow for new talent coming in uh, in the future to support any de deficiencies that they may have you know, today. And Mike, with, um, you know, will you, would you mind explaining a little bit more to our audience about how um, Desert Angels does their investing? So you mentioned the coachability. So is this, is your investments a lot more hands-on when, when the organization invests or is it a little more hands-off? So it depends on the investment, but many of the investments we make are more hands-on. Um, we, um, uh, we do a, a number of second stage investments. So we do reinvest in companies, but in the early stages, uh, yeah, we, we tend to really want to play a role. We don't demand board seats necessarily. It depends on the circumstances, but we do want to establish a strong mentoring relationship between members of our group that have an interest in the company and the company itself. Mm -hmm. Arif, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. So coming in as a later stage, uh, you know, more of the expansion type funding, what is your fund's role as far as, you know, the ongoing operations? Are you active board seats, um, very active in the business? Absolutely. We, we don't want to write a check and, and walk away. And so typically when we invest in everything from a series A to a series C, um, we are very often taking board seats, if not that, then an observer seat, depending on whether we're leading or following. But, but we're invested in, in kind of going through the journey together. And so that can be everything from figuring out partnership opportunities, uh, revenue expansion strategies, making the right connections to, um, to possible clients, everything along those side that really keep those revenues going, to helping you find the talent that's going to enable you to move from a business that's doing, you know, a million to 10 to 50 to get the talent that's really going to facilitate that as well. And then obviously fundraising is a, is a key part of the journey. And so we're very actively involved in helping them. But yes, we, we certainly love to get involved in each of those areas uh, as much as we can. Yeah. And coming out of the Bay Area into Arizona, um, you know, how do you feel about the investments in the investment opportunities in Arizona? I know it's something that we've been working on to create more of like a, a tech corridor and a tech hub to have more, bring in more um, outside of Arizona companies. I'm curious to hear your perspective. Yeah, I mean, we, we are very excited about the potential to see these, these clusters form and uh, a lot of joint passions and entrepreneurs with similar areas really getting together in new geographies and bringing that talent and bring that expertise. And we think Arizona is one of those areas where we really want to focus. And so for us, we look, you know, we're based in the Bay Area, but we really do look across the US and we get very excited when we see particular areas like WETEC in Arizona, where we just think the right parts of the formula are coming together. And so seeing a company there, we actually think it gives them an advantage and so we are looking and we count that as almost a catalyst or an enabler 
for that company to get to revenue at an efficient uh, amount of cost. Well, Mike and, and Romy, uh, I know you guys have both done so much as far as helping to build that ecosystem where there is fundraising available. So hats off to both of you. And Mike, you know, coming from the from the entrepreneur's perspective, we, we frequently hear and we, that there's not enough venture capital in Arizona in order to support that innovation ecosystem. You know, do you think that's ac accurate? Yeah, unfortunately, I do think it's accurate. Um, you know, historically, uh, um, there's not been a large number of venture capital firms that are based here and operating here. That's changing a little bit. I'm not as familiar with what's happening in Phoenix, but in Tucson, for example, we have three new, relatively new venture capital firms that are operating. Uh, we need more. Uh, mm -hmm. but the other thing we need is to get the word out to existing venture capital firms on the coasts or wherever they may be. Um, because, you know, the, the sad fact of the matter is, at least as far as Tucson is concerned, we're considered to be a flyover state. Uh, flyover city, maybe, is the best way to put it. So mm -hmm. we need to get those guys from Silicon Valley to stop here. Um, and there's some challenges in that, but um, we think that's, uh, that's definitely possible for the future. Um, and that's where we have to go. Romy, you know, what, how do you feel about, um, you know, Mike's uh, analysis of the, the funding and the capital available in Arizona? I know he spoke more specifically to Tucson, but would you be willing to comment on Phoenix? And, you know, you know, do you think there's enough capital available? And what can we do? What can our wearable ecosystem do in order to help bring more um, access to capital to the state? Sure, sure. You know, I mean, this is, um, I think generally speaking, I don't know of any community in the United States who feels, you know, on the startup side that they have enough capital. You know, I think that you could go anywhere and they'll all say, you know, it's just hard to raise money. Um, here, though, we are perfectly poised to really become something, I think, to reckon with on the national venture landscape. Let me explain. You know, I think that one item is we have the second highest GDP in the Rocky Mountain region. The second item is that we have the highest amount of federal R&D that is, you know, deployed into the state by the federal government um, by an order of 2x over Colorado. We have the most college students enrolled by semester in, than any other state in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, and we have more public technology companies here in Arizona than any other state in the Rocky Mountain region and in the Sonoran region. I start talking about our technology wins and we just start wondering, well, where is the capital? That's something that like obviously Mike is solving I'm doing my best too. And I think it's really important for innovators to keep in mind that the um, Arizona capital challenges of a decade ago are not quite the same as they were today. Uh, we do have a different collection of managers who are raising capital and writing checks into the state. Um, and the thing that has changed across the board is that Arizona entrepreneurs are absolutely prepared to raise venture capital, deploy venture capital into their companies, and they're just exceptional. I think they are a few orders of magnitude stronger than founders from 2010 to 2012. There's a really exceptional group we have here right now, and I think it's only a matter of time until we produce gigantic returns for early stage investors here. Um, it's just up to Mike and me and everybody else who wants to join, come on in, let's go raise funds and let's try to solve this capital conundrum for Arizona founders. I love it. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate, you know, Romy, Mike, thanks for all the work you do. Arif, thanks for coming and investing and keeping our capital flowing by investing in our um, Arizona-based companies. But fascinating discussion, so much incredible insight. You guys have been great panelists. Um, audience, I'm sure you have burning questions. Now remember, these wonderful folks are going to be sticking around for our happy hour and will be available to answer even more questions. So thank you again. So audience, I hope that you found our first two acts helpful. Act three is going to help you understand the amazing resources we have available right here in Phoenix that are going to help you bring your ideas to life. 
So joining us today, we have Kathleen Lee. She serves as Greater Phoenix Economic Council's Senior Vice President for Regional Initiatives. Kathleen is amazing and also the Director of Applied Research at the Partnership for Economic Innovation. Brandon Clark is the founder and CEO of the Startup AZ Foundation. Um, I know for those of you guys that have been in uh, Arizona for a while, you don't go through very many discussions without hearing about Brandon and the work that Startup AZ Foundation has been doing. Thomas Schumann is the executive director at the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation, affectionately known as CEI. And I personally am a huge fan of CEI. I went through um, their program they have and it is so helpful and it's such a, a great forum for getting to meet other uh, local entrepreneurs. And I'm excited to also have Anthony Bajoras with us, who is the program manager for the MedTech Ventures program. So we're so glad to have all of you with us today and to talk about your organizations and how it can help all of our innovators here today. So let's get started with you, Kathleen. Will you tell us about the Partnership for Economic Innovation and how PEI fits into our innovative ecosystem? Thanks, Vicki. Um, I actually have the best job um, working with Tom, Brandon, Anthony, uh, and other organizations that have been uh, represented here at this event today. Um, they really represent uh, the, our biggest uh, uh, and greatest assets in our wearable uh, tech ecosystem. Uh, almost five years ago, Partnership for Economic Innovation was formed as a result of a regional effort led by GPEC, MAG, mayors, and business leaders. Um, PI's role in the wearable tech um, is to advocate for resources, uh, bring innovators and industry together to develop new products and services and connect and collaborate with ecosystem organizations like CEI, Startup AZ Foundation, and MedTech Ventures. Our ecosystem partners work along a continuum of innovation. Um, at WearTech, we help innovators, whether they're from industry, university, startup community, or you know, other places or in the community um, develop new products and services that have high potential for commercial success. Um, our ecosystem partners help companies through commercialization and growth phases. Um, with events like this one, we're hoping to engage more innovators and organizations who want to be part of this uh, great ecosystem. All of the work that we're doing uh, it's supported by our communities. We're grateful to City of Phoenix team for their support. We're also lucky to have 13 leaders uh, with clinical business and research expertise on our WearTech board. Um, I think what we're building at WearTech is unique and exciting. Um, I hope after the event, more innovators and industry leaders join that effort to build a national hub for wearable innovation right here in Greater Phoenix. Uh, back to you, Vicki. Kathleen, thank you so much. Now, one more follow-on question for you. I'm sure innovators are wanting to know how can they connect um, you know, with you specifically or PEI and, and learn more about all the services and supports you have to offer. So is there a website or a way to, that folks can reach out to you? Well, thanks for that question, Vicki. Um, yes. Uh, we do have a website, it's azwearetech.org. Uh, we're actually in the process of uh, refreshing our website. We have all of our project information on there. We have contact information on there. Um, and there's also um, uh, azpi.org, which is our, our uh, partnership for economic innovation.org. Of course, you can also find me through, my, uh, through gpec.org. And I will say, if you want to find Kathleen, you will be able to find her. She's so accessible and she really goes out of her way to put on her thinking cap and pull out resources. Um, so I've personally reached out to Kathleen myself many times with different types of questions and support, and she's wonderful. So Kathleen, thank you so much. We appreciate that. And we're so grateful um, for PEI. Now, Tom, I'm excited to hear uh, more about CEI. Will you please share with everyone you know, what CEI does 
And specifically, what new support programs do you have that will help to enhance opportunities for our innovators? Yes, uh, thank you, Vicki, and uh, thank you for hosting this program, uh, Kathleen. Um, CEI, we're, we're a traditional business incubator. And, and you know, we work with companies from the concept stage until they're in sales. And we primarily work with companies in the bioscience medical device fields. Um, and so where tech fits right in there. Um, we offer, you know, state-of-the-art wet lab facilities and private offices and meeting spaces here at our location. But the heart of the program is the business coaching and counseling that goes along that we provide and the subject matter experts that we bring in, um, as well as the, you know, the collaborative environment that's kind of created inside of an incubator itself between all the, 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 the tenants and clients here, just the interactions uh, that happen between them. It's, it's just a really fruitful kind of a, a environment to be in. Um, our newest program is something that we call Market Validation Essentials, um, and it's a 12-week a program. It's, it's a combination of training, one-on-one uh, -on -one uh, business counseling, um, and access to marketing research tools and databases. Where this all came about is we started talking with a number of the investors uh, in the community, many of the people that were in your previous segment about what could we do to help um, the founders that are coming to them with their business pitches improve on those. And, and the number one thing, the common theme that came out from all these interviews was that um, many of these founders really don't understand or can't convince them that they truly understand the problem that they're setting out to solve. You know, it was the P in uh, Romy's PHX, and I think uh, Mike called it, you know, the unmet need. Um, but so often in these technology areas, we have companies coming out with these cutting edge technologies, and they're looking for a problem that they can uh, apply it to. So in market validation essentials, we kind of flip that around. Uh, we take them through a very formal um, customer discovery and customer interview process to really understand what problems that customer is facing. They're not even allowed to talk about their solutions or their technologies yet. It's just really understanding what those needs are that are out there. From then, we work with them to help develop what their unique value proposition is. You know, what's that special sauce or that unfair advantage that, that they can bring to the market? And then we go back and do another round of, of interviews with those potential customers. Is, is this what's going to, to fit your need? Um, we also provide them some access to marketing research databases so they can get the data that they need, both to find out the size of the market and their segment within it, uh, but also to learn more about who the competitors are and how they can develop a competitive advantage, you know, in this industry. Um, and finally, we help them, you know, put a go-to-market strategy together, so how they can go about, you know, getting the customer acquisition that we need. So the goal is that um, they've gone a long way towards proving that that product market fit is there before they start going out building the prototypes and, and spending a lot of investment dollars um, to build products and, and, uh, and companies before they validate it. So um, that's our newest thing. And, uh, you know, we look forward to a, a, a number of, of announcements here in 2021. Fabulous. Well, thank you. Um, Brandon. Curious to, to share with everybody, how does Startup AZ fit into this ecosystem and how can you be helpful to people that have big ideas? Yeah, thanks, Vicki. Um, this has been fun. I love this rapid fire virtual seminar. This has been a blast. Um, some really good feedback. I, I think, you know, for us, you know, we, we look at the Startup AZ exists to help entrepreneurs grow and give back. We feel the virtuous cycle, the, the flywheel effect, as we call it, of generosity and performance is embedded in any ecosystem anywhere. And I think the more we can help uh, entrepreneurs role model what performance looks like, it increases the generosity, that give back component. I think Romy touched on it. You know, founders paying it forward to the next generation. We really exist to help inspire that. Uh, really programmatically, we look at programs like what Tom just described with CEI as a pipeline. So as these innovators and entrepreneurs, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, those that are executing on big ideas, they ultimately need each other. And so we've created some infrastructure around an initiative called Startup AZ Collective, where we identify emerging founders that have products further a little bit, you know, long in the life cycle. So they have a product that's in market. It could be hardware related, it could be technology or software related. But their mindset has shifted to market validation and product market fit to, to company building. And we heard the investors talk a lot about teams and investing in teams. 
Because at the end of the day, everything we're talking about, everything that Joe and Nick and Thurman, you know, introduced us to today, uh, which is some amazing technology, it's, it's going to require humans to move that from A to B. And so ultimately, the collective is identifying uh, groups of founders. We put them into cohorts at similar stages. It's a 12-month commitment that they make, uh, not only to themselves, it really kind of pushed their own accountability, but to, to their tribe, as we call it, to their fellow founders. They help move them forward to really circle the wagons on the resources and things that we need. I can touch on one other thing, and Romy articulated it perfectly, but really the capital challenges here. You know, and it seemed that, I mean, we're a state with 115,000 millionaires. Those are accredited investors on paper. I think as an ecosystem, we've done a poor job telling that story. And I think we're in this new wave that we're starting to emerge these stories. You're starting to see some of these businesses really take flight. And I think that's gonna start unlocking some of the capital and then ultimately some of the talent challenges that we face. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Did you say 115 million accredited 115,000 millionaires, yeah, yeah. Yep. 115,000 millionaires. Fascinating. Well, we definitely need to send them all a memo or a tweet or whatever it takes Absolutely. to get them out and investing back into our state. Um, Anthony, we are saving the best for last. Will you please tell us about MedTech Ventures and how this fascinating program can help entrepreneurs? Sure. Thanks, Vicki. I think I might sound like a broken record, um, uh, but I think that probably speaks to all the resources in the ecosystem here that are that are really working to help support uh, a lot of these early stage companies, the founders and, and the innovations. Uh, so MedTech Ventures helps founders and early stage companies figure out really what resources they need, and then we help them find those resources. And for most companies, uh, it can be an array of things, but it's often two things primarily. It's capital and it's people, right? And it's usually really capital <laughs> is, is, is what they need. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll work with them to figure out uh, what their funding needs and uses are. And, and oftentimes that gets uh, deep into uh, the details of where the business is at, where they, where they need to go, where the product is. Um, and, and it can mean helping them address those deficiencies uh, and helping them prepare uh, to be ready to raise capital, right? To have conversations uh, with folks like Romy and Mike and Arif, right? Um, and by the way, um, most investors um, most investors are unique, right? So just because you're, you're prepared for one investor conversation doesn't mean you're prepared for all of them. Uh, particularly in the med tech space and, and where tech space, those, those are unique investors. So um, uh, once we've helped uh, them prepare uh, to, to, to raise capital, uh, we can help them build and execute the investor acquisition uh, strategy and plan. And usually uh, in terms of the stages of funding, these are very early stage businesses, right? So we, we kind of divide this in the, in the four sec segments. Um, certainly incubation acceleration stages we work with, right? But we also go a little bit earlier than that, which is what we call innovation all the way to the very first stage, which is uh, uh, ideation, right? Usually where you have a founder who has an idea and is, is looking to develop from there. So in terms of the funding needs, uh, this uh, in rounds of funding, this really ranges from pre-seed, seed, uh, seed plus to series A capital. And uh, this is, uh, I think, from my experience and a lot of uh, other founders' experience, uh, this is the dif most difficult stage to raise capital, right? This is the funding gap, right? Uh, you're, you're typically pre-revenue, right, until you get to, to some of those later seed plus or series A rounds. Uh, and it's particularly uh, difficult for um, uh, device-based products, right? So. Uh, uh, we'll typically work with them uh, in those earliest of stages, which is really to, to address that, that most difficult funding need. Um, so some of these ventures also need people. So we'll work with them, uh, with the companies or the founders to uh, uh, match them with experienced collaborators. Uh, and and uh, oftentimes these are individuals, sometimes they're, they're vendors. Uh, they can be across the entire skill range. They can be from engineering, business folks, subject matter experts. Um, and because uh, so many of our willing, uh, so many of our innovators are willing to work for equity, it can also help reduce that capital need, right? Which is which is one way of of uh, um, making sure that these companies continue to move forward. Um, 
and perhaps make it a little easier to, to actually uh, um, uh, make it across that funding gap. That's it. That's yeah. all. Of it. That's it. That's all of it. Okay. Um, now, out of curiosity, if somebody does want to get more information on MedTech Ventures, is there a website we could direct them to? Uh, sure. It's uh, medtechventures.org. Perfect. <laughs> Easy to remember. Um, and now, Brianda, I wanted to wrap back around. Now, I know you have the collective that's going on, and I believe you take cohorts every summer. Is that correct? We typically start recruiting in the spring, but the experience kicks off typically over the summer. That's right. But the application is open all year. So is there a website or a place people could go to apply for the next upcoming cohort? Sure. Uh, so startupazcollective.org uh, or even quicker, startupaz.org. Um, absolutely. I spend a good chunk of my time talking to founders and uh, I love hearing what's out there and what's upcoming and um, you know, keeping everybody in the loop. But yeah, typically springtime is when we start recruiting. Thanks, Vicky. Perfect. Thanks. And Tom, um, what's the CEI website? And, and I also wanted to, I didn't want to take away from that, but I know you had some news about a little bit of a CEI expansion. You want to share that with us as well as a way that we can learn more about CEI and connect with you? Yeah, well, uh, the easy one first, yeah, our, our uh, web address is ceigateway.com. Um, and yes, we're really excited to be opening up our, our second location. Um, it'll be part of the Phoenix Biomedical Campus in, in, in downtown Phoenix. And, and we'll be opening up a, a ground floor location in the new Wexford and Science and Technology Building. Um, I understand this week that the contractors are going through and fixing the few items that are on our punch list. So I think we're a week or two away from getting uh, the keys to our new location. So pretty excited about that. We'll be housing two programs down there. Uh, one will be what we call our, our validation lab, which is that market uh, validation centrals program uh, that I talked about. Some really neat spaces that are designed there for it, where they can come in um, and do the, the research uh, and the databases. Um, but we also have this fabulous events uh, area that is designed for pitch competitions. So it's kind of like a pitch arena. So it's going to be a lot of fun stuff, a co-working area for people to come and spend some time. Um, uh, we'll also be there. And then we're also locating um, a program that we call Lab Force down there. Um, and Lab Force is a, a statewide uh, workforce development and professional development program uh, for the bioscience industry. So we will be doing hands on training uh, downtown, the new location right there, and the part of all that biomedical activity. Uh, but we'll also be launching a learning system that will have over 2,000 courses uh, loaded into it when we launched uh, in early 21. Um, and it's a broad range of programming, everything from, uh, you know, entry level programs for laboratory technicians to what, you know, a scientist might need to know about, you know, the latest FDA regulations about how to remotely monitor, you know, their, their trials and things. So um, okay. looking forward to all that and looking right. forward to later in the summer when we can all get you downtown and into the, the building face to face again. Well, we, are, we will definitely be happy to share out the information about that, Tom. Well, I have to say, everyone, that hour just flew by. I hope you found our virtual open house informative and helpful, but we know that you're all ready for that waiting, that moment you've been waiting for, a chance to meet all of our speakers face-to-face -face and get your questions answered. So speakers, now is the time to head over to your respective Zoom sessions. Audience, please take a moment, grab your drink of choice and meet us here at azwearetech.org backslash NHH for networking happy hour. You're gonna see a Zoom directory there. Please hop in, connect with each speaker. From everyone here at WearTech, we are, we so appreciate you. We're so happy that you were able to make it and we can't wait to engage directly and have these experts answer some of your burning questions. So I'll see you soon.